and welcome to another special COVID-19 Super Pandemic edition of Wide World of Dissection. Today we turn our attention to that most unusual of all predators, the starfish. Starfish, or sea stars, belong to the phylum Echinodermata, that is, the spiny-skinned deuterostomes, and to the class Asteroidea. As you can see by this doughboy starfish, most have clear pentameral symmetry, displaying five arms, each with a broad attachment to the central disc. But a few, such as this crown of thorn sea star, which feeds on coral and is well known for ravaging tropical reefs, can sport up to a dozen or more arms. Although radially symmetric as adults, they begin life as a bilaterally symmetric larva that then metamorphoses into the adult with its wheel-like symmetry. Starfish come in a variety of sizes, textures, and colors, some of them quite exotic. Here we have a beautiful blue sea star, Linkia levigata, which hails from tropical waters of the Indo-Pacific, as does the red knob sea star, Protoreaster linkii. Both species bear the name of Johann Heinrich Link, a German naturalist of the 18th century. These striking markings belong to the royal sea star, which can be found in the Caribbean. And these purple sea stars, which oddly enough can sometimes be orange, are found in shallow ocean waters of North America, from Prince William Sound to just north of Los Angeles. Because they are common in estuaries and intertidal zones, they are often observed at slow tide. This warty sea star, Echinaster colossus, looking a bit like a half-dressed Michelin man, is found in the Indian Ocean, ranging east from the African coast to the waters surrounding Australia and the Philippines. And this stubby-armed bat star, Pateria miniata, is named for the webbing that might be said to resemble a bat's wing, if one had never laid eyes on a bat. Sea stars are predators who make their living by hunting down a variety of invertebrate prey and enthusiastically wrestling them into submission. This, st this starfish is putting a full Nelson on a bivalve mollusk, and this one is applying a complex scissor hole to a hapless sea cucumber. Although starfish are slow and generally lacking in the adaptations typical of a predator, they are able to succeed in this unlikely niche by choosing prey that are either slow or sessile and thus easily subdued. Using their two feet, they are able to bring a great deal of force to bear on their prey. They also, oddly enough, are able to avert their cardiac stomach and secrete digestive enzymes onto their prey externally. Other starfish, such as this Velcro sea star from the family Brasingidae, have fallen into line with the other radially symmetric organisms and reverted to filter feeding. To the uninitiated, starfish appear to be lacking in complex behavior and emotion, and it is true that they are indeed stoic creatures with few outward signs to betray their internal states. You might look at scenes like this, where two recently adopted sea stars display little outward emotion at meeting their new parents for the first time, and think them simply incapable of deep feeling. However, the attentive student of these unassuming creatures will begin to pick up on a range of subtle, understated emotions familiar to those living through a pandemic. Here we have a royal starfish experiencing contentment, while well, this one is suffering from ennui. Let's see that one more time. Contentment. Ennui. Contentment. Ennui. Contentment. And here the sea star becomes disturbed by its own level of contentment and indulges in mild self-loathing. Only rarely do we see these even-killed invertebrates tip over into extreme emotions like despair or joy. One reason for the uncanny equanimity of the sea star is their devotion to the practice of yoga and the calm that it brings, a devotion that is enthusiastic and entirely fictional. Here we have the firefly pose, and this of course is the corpse pose. Here we have sun salutation, followed by anemone salutation, the archer pose, the peekaboo pose, and finally the ever popular barca lounger pose. Because of their predatory habits and their taste for bivalve mollusks, sea stars have long been considered a pest species by oyster fishermen. It has been reported that fishermen used to cut up starfish whenever they pulled them up in their nets and then toss the pieces back into the sea. 
If true, this would have been a spectacularly unsuccessful means of sea star control, given the significant regenerative abilities of these echinoderms. Here we see a starfish in the process of regenerating several missing arms. And here we see a single arm regenerating an entire new starfish, central disc and all. More recent control methods include this starfish mop, which can be dragged through the oyster beds to snag the spines of sea stars and then pulled up and dunked in hot water. Starfish numbers would perhaps be easier to control if more people found them to be an appetizing dish, but the gourmand with any enthusiasm for starfish on a stick is a rare breed indeed, and the most that can be said for them as an appetizer is that if prepared correctly they are not completely inedible. Now we will examine the external anatomy of the sea star. As we've discussed previously, the adult starfish has radial symmetry that is characterized as pentameral, or five-part symmetry. We see here five arms surrounding the central disc, and at the center of that disc is the central axis through which we can pass any number of planes of symmetry, producing mirror image halves. Because they show radial symmetry, we do not use words like anterior and posterior, or dorsal and ventral, to describe the cardinal points of direction on the starfish. Instead, we refer to the oral and aboral surfaces. Here on the left, we have the oral surface, on which you can see the mouth right in the middle of the central disc. And projecting out along each arm, we have the ambulacral grooves. From within these grooves emerge the tube feet, which are used primarily for locomotion and feeding. On the right side over here, we have the aboral surface, meaning not the oral surface. Major features of the aboral surface include the madreporite, the opening of the water vascular system, and the anus. So sea stars do have a complete digestive tract, with a mouth on the oral surface and an anus on the aboral surface. This makes for rather a short digestive tract, but it is nevertheless a complete one. As we will see, they also make good use of the space inside the arms for digestive glands known as the pyloric cica. Some of the most interesting external features are impossible to see well without the use of a dissecting scope. Among these are the pedicellaria, little pinchers that resemble lobster claws and are used for keeping the external surface free of debris. One of the things the pedicellaria are protecting are small sacs known as papulae, which are used for obtaining oxygen. These little projections of the membrane lining the salomic cavity extend out through tiny gaps between the ossicles of the endoskeleton and increase the surface area for gas exchange. Now we're going to take a look at the internal anatomy of the starfish. In order to do so, I'm going to cut through here the body wall on the aboral side of two of the arms and the central disc. And we'll peel back the sensitive, delicate tissues underneath, make sure we don't lose any of those. And then we'll take a look at the digestive and reproductive anatomy first. So here we've got the upper portion removed, which gives us a view here. We'll zoom in a bit of the internal anatomy. So we see here projecting out into each arm the pyloric cica. And the pyloric cica is attached through the pyloric duct to this upper stomach, the pyloric stomach. Okay, which lies on top of the cardiac stomach. So the food would pass through the mouth into the cardiac stomach and then from the cardiac stomach into the pyloric stomach and then through a short passageway from the pyloric stomach uh, through the anus on the aboral surface. Now if we look underneath the pyloric cica, we'll see the gonads. Right? And the gonads vary quite a bit in size depending on the reproductive state of the specimen. Uh, but you, here you can see gonads in each of the arms. There will be gonads in the three remaining arms that we haven't dissected as well. 
The last system we'll examine is the water vascular system, a system that is unique to the echinoderms and which controls the tube feet, those structures that are so important in both feeding and locomotion. The water vascular system has an opening called the madreporite, uh, which is here on the central disc. We've left that portion of the central disc for you to view. Uh, and then you have here in the middle of the central disc, you have a ring canal. Uh, that ring canal communicates with the madreporite through what's called the stone canal. And that's what you can see here. If we pick up the starfish and turn it a bit, you can see the stone canal right there. Okay, that's the stone canal that connects the ring canal to the madreporite. Now, the ring canal also connects out to the radial canals, which project out into each of the arms. And they run along the tops of these ambulacral ridges. So you can see here an ambulacral ridge running out into each of the arms uh, bearing a radial canal. Now if you look just to either side of each of the ambulacral ridges, you'll see a bunch of little bubbles, which are actually the ampulla of the tube feet. Uh, so the tops of the tube feet. Now if we flip this starfish over and we look at the ambulacral grooves, we can see the bottom of the tube foot, the sucker and the podium, the foot of the tube foot, if you will, uh, coming out of those ambulacral grooves. Well, that's it for our exploration of the sea star. So long for now. Next time, we'll be looking at another fearsome predator of the deep, the shark. Thanks for watching.